Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you again for um, taking time out of your busy Friday to be with us today. Uh, we're very privileged to have you. I'm, I'm Franco Sobrano, the CEO of CLI, and with me is our hardworking CFO, Mr. Grant uh, Cheng here. And we are also assisted by our team here in Cebu, um, in our main office. So the year has gone by very quickly. Uh, we're very proud and pleased to report that CLI continues its growth trend. Uh, we already reported in the uh, start of the year that we already exceeded pre-pandemic performance in um, 2021. So 2022 is um, shaping up to be a banner year for us. Um, you can see here that we've sustained earnings growth momentum, 40% growth year on year. Um, so this is normalized net income to parent increased 1.55 billion um, so we're at 1.55 billion. That's our highest um, half uh, performance so far in our history. And this is a jump from the 1.11 billion in the first half of 2021 after taking out the ta tax adjust adjustment uh, due to create. This is really driven by the very, very strong top line growth across all segments. Consolidated revenues increased to 7.5 billion from 5.1 billion. Uh, I like going back down memory lane. I think we were just um, 2 billion the whole year, five years ago. So now we're at 7.5 billion uh, with six months to spare. We have a very solid and healthy balance sheet of 75 billion in quality um, assets. And, and the asset growth was driven by the increase in receivables as units became ready for takeout. We've as you know, we're, we're a very busy company. We're, we're very busy on the ground here. We actually launched seven residential projects worth 7.4 billion in sales value so far. And we recently uh, made available very exclusive prime commercial lots for sale worth 7.7 .7 billion in our Davao Global Township. Uh, the busiest guy in the room is to my right, to your left on the screen with uh, Grant Chang leading our um, our first uh, retail bond offering um, due to the overwhelming uh, demand and interest from 5 billion offering with a 3 billion over subscription. It's now a 8 billion offering. We're very proud to have increased our um, bond rating from an AA and now to a double A plus with table outlook. Uh, so we're very honored and we've actually been very busy the last two weeks meeting various investors and um, um, and also the retail market. With this, with, with the very positive momentum that we have, we are poised to exceed our year-end year -end earnings guidance of 20%. Uh, thanks to you, our investors, who uh, keep us very motivated. So next slide. So I will um, uh, let Grant discuss the financial performance, then I'll come back for the business updates and milestones and, and with Mr. Cheng to conclude our briefing with the outlook for 2022. So Grant, please yeah. take it away. Thanks, Franco. Uh, I'm only busy because you're equally busy uh, putting deploying our funds and putting them to work now. So uh, our capital is being put to good use in construction, uh, meeting construction targets and really delivering houses that have been uh, sold and you know have been reserved many years ago. Um, so it's just a matter of delivering this and putting them on our financial statement. And uh, this is where we are now. In the first half of 2022, our uh, revenues are still mostly driven by our real estate sales at 7.3 billion, stands at 7.45 billion overall revenues, which is a growth of 45%. Uh, uh, year on year uh, versus first half of 2021. Last year, um, our gross profit stands after cost of sales stands at 3.3 billion versus 2.3 billion last year. So you could see that um, our, uh, our top line is growing well, demand continues to be strong. And this is a reflection of our operational continuity and our operational strength, the, the ability to deliver on reservation sales. Resulting in a consolidated net income after tax of almost uh, 1.6 billion and a parent 
net income after tax of 1.5 billion. So overall, this means that we are pretty much on track to hit what we said would be our guide, our guidance, what we said would be our growth in top line and our bottom line. When the year started, uh, we said that we grow 20%. So far, the first half we've grown 40%. So we're pretty confident that we're in prime position to meet, if not exceed, our guidance targets. A quick note of why we emphasize and we want to show the growth, and we're using the growth numbers using normalized earnings. Uh, last year, as you're probably all aware, um, there was a one-off effect on our financial statements, a positive one-off effect, of course, due to the CREATE bill. By lowering our corporate income tax rate from 30% to 25%, it gave us the ability to recalculate our deferred tax liabilities. In other words, income tax payable from future collections that we were projecting. So we lowered it from 30 to 25%, resulting in a one-time gain of 209 million from that create law. Of course, it's a non-cash gain yet, but this means we pay less taxes in the future. This one-off event, of course, is not part of our operating, uh, it's not part of our normal operating activity. So in order to compare apples to apples and to really see the growth of our operations and our financial performance taking out this one-off effect, we highlight this normalized earnings at the parent level of 1.55 versus 1.1 billion. Again, we're just taking away a little bit or just taking away that one-off effect. That resulted in a 40% growth in our earnings per share. And this is something that we also want to highlight. We are using the number of shares normalized after our stock dividends because there was no dilution, no real capital anyway that went into CLI. So the way we would like to show our earnings per share from the same capital base is on the adjusted post-stock dividend number of shares. We were able to achieve this while maintaining our margins. So you did notice there was a very slight pressure on our margins due to inflationary pressures. This is a reflection of the challenging inflationary environment we face mostly through quarter one, but has stabilized since in quarter two. Franco will elaborate uh, quite extensively on how, for example, our input prices have stabilized, how, uh, for, for example, steel and cement costs and fuel costs, as you all probably uh, under, uh, know, uh, have reached a peak and have now moved back to lower levels. and so. Um, on a first half and on in a blended basis, um, it we managed to mitigate the impact on our gross profit margin. Next slide, clear. Our realized and unrealized revenues continue to grow. So this is a, a great sign of the continuous growth uh, of your company in the foreseeable future as well. So I keep emphasizing that even as we are on track to reach another year of record-breaking growth, um, we probably, and again, we are, uh, this gives us a lot of confidence about our ability to meet, if not exceed, our earnings target. Not only are we growing our actual revenues, we're actually growing our warehouse or so what we call unrealized revenue. So yung baon namin na revenues is even increasing. This is mainly driven by the economic or housing business segment, uh, giving us 49% revenues from there and 28% coming geographically from Cebu. And uh, this is a, a good sign. And we just continue to serve into the very much underserved demand here in Vismin of the housing sector. Uh, there are, by our estimation, there are over 2 million, probably, close, probably closer to 2.5 million of housing backlog in this main area. So imagine if you just put an average of 3 million pesos per house. That We're talking about a 7.5 trillion peso backlog of housing demand here in this main alone. So we want to dominate the state. We want to continue to become number one. And we will foresee, we, that, that's what gives us the confidence of being able to achieve this continuous growth. We're not going to do anything crazy or anything new. We're simply doing 
what we've done well already in the previous years, and we'll con just continue to do that uh, and be on that growth path. Our reservation sales uh, is showing a very good trend. So uh, we've already closed over 8.28 billion pesos in reservation sales for the uh, year to date. And we're targeting another 5.5 billion in quarter three. And uh, this is, uh, this is with this kind of result, uh, it's going to very likely be another banner record breaking year of reservation sales. Again, um, this is one of my favorite numbers uh, to keep track of because uh, while financial statements is a lagging indicator each of demand, it does show how well we are building up the product to meet previous year's sales. These numbers show our actual market impact and the actual market demand when we go on our launches and our road shows and when we bring a new product to the market. And if you look at the pandemic years of 2020 and 2021, we continue to grow. There, uh, the, the fact is there's just so much more demand than there is supply that even through the two years of pandemic, we were able to we were able to sell out our inventory and really just serve the many, many layers of underserved demand. Okay, next slide. So uh, later Franco will be able to actually pinpoint and in fact identify which projects uh, we're going to launch in the second half of this year that will allow us to exceed those targets. So these are all moving up uh, along their own timeline from a permitting and design standpoint, but we're pretty confident that these launches are going to be uh, are going to be well well taken up if the first half is any indication. Um, our prime example is you have to know the market, right? You have to know the market to know where and what to sell. And we a prime example is that four tower condominium we launched in Davao. We sold out four billion pesos worth of inventory, I think within a month. And so that's the kind of success and that's the kind of market understanding that we wish to continue in the second half. Uh, moving on, I want to show you our balance sheet. Uh, we're just highlighting the growth of our balance sheet. We've now uh, grown our balance sheet to 74 billion pesos. It is quite a significant growth. It's a 12% growth just in the first half of this year from 66 billion uh, year end of 2021. And it is mostly driven by the growth of our accounts receivables and contract assets. Or in other words, the value of the contracts we are allowed to recognize already. And these are, these are this is simply uh, uh, a reflection of future cash collections. So we sleep very well at night knowing that all our capital obligations, our debt service obligations are more than covered just on our sales alone book on our financial statements. So I want you to, I want to give you this quick mental exercise. Remember, I, I showed you that we had over 26 billion pesos worth of unrealized revenues or sales value that we're not putting on our balance sheet or in our financial statements yet. Now you add that to the over 30 billion pesos of sales value that is on our financial statements. That's over 56 billion pesos in contract sales of cash that we will convert in the next three to five years as the project completes. So it's, for us, it's just a matter of sticking to our budget, constructing well, and turning over on time and we are very, very comfortable and uh, with how we're managing our capital. Um, it's one project, one project facility loan. We, never, we don't kite our projects, we don't double leverage. That is why later when I talk a little bit about, about our retail bonds, um, you know, that is the same confidence that we were able to express to our credit ratings agencies as well as to our underwriters. Okay, next slide. This is our debt maturity profile and a quick look at how we're managing our debt profile. Uh, we wanted to show you that we're avoiding very high towers at any given year. Um, in the next 12 months, uh, we are uh, 
we're projecting a cash collection from our completed uh, units of about 8 billion pesos, if not more. So if you compare the 8 billion we are scheduled to collect in the next 12 months versus the debt maturity profile, you could see how, uh, you know, how the prudence and the comfort by which we know we can service our debt. One very key strategy that we're doing is we're trying to move more of our debt towards the fixed end and the long end of the curve. And the reason for this is I think uh, it, it's quite obvious with the off cycle increase of the BSP, uh, the recent movement of the yield curves. It's the shorter end of the curve that's being affected a little bit more when you see increase in the reference rate. In fact, if anything, the longer end of our reference yield curves of the Bival curve is a little bit more stable. In fact, it's gone down in the last couple of weeks no, since May. And so our strategy is to ship a little bit more of our debt from the short end into the long end. So if you've been following our retail bond offering, we're offering it at 3.5, 5.5, and 7 years. So at the 5.5 and 7 years, we're talking about putting more debt here in the longer end of the curve where rates are pretty stable and where we feel it is an advantageous position for your company to fix rates. So right now, um, we have just under 35% of our debt profile uh, using floater rate. And these are the, uh, these are the, the uh, these are the rates that are quite competitive, but we plan to move them to the longer end after we finish our retail bond exercise. Okay. Our overall cost of debt still stands at 4.78. Uh, percent per annum, uh, so very competitive in our opinion, especially for a high capex real estate developer like us. Next slide. Please. So just to quickly recap um, our ongoing uh, retail bond offering. So we have filed our registration statements uh, with the SEC and we are undergoing a review uh, with uh, the SEC. So just to be very technical and very proper about this, we are in the process of applying and getting our permit to sell uh, approved. And we have already proactively responded to our comment, to the comments and the reviews of the various parties involved. We are in the process of uh, scanning the market for demand. And we have, uh, we have a very high confidence that uh, there is enough demand out there um, for our 8 billion retail bonds. Um, there will be three series. I mentioned 3.5, 5.5, and 7 years uh, with the indicative spreads uh, being presented to you here. And we look, uh, we look forward to the offer period where this can, you know, we will accept the offers from the public um, sometime in the second week of September. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, I now turn you over to Franco uh, so we could talk about uh, our specific projects and business updates that underpins our financial performances. And later, I'll recap for you our 2022 outlook. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Grant. Uh, as always, thank you for articulating that uh, very well. So I want to breeze through our business updates. Um, we have now uh, expanded our land bank to 116 hectares. Of course, this is net of whatever we've developed. And uh, we've reported that we've developed over 90 billion worth of real estate over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, you can see here a new addition to our growing portfolio. You can see here uh, Butuan City. We've always eyed it and we finally got a very good property there. Uh, and that's where we're going to bring our award-winning Casamira uh, project. And we should be able to start development there next year. Uh, so you can see here that we really held steady, uh, net of our, our, our strength in new launches, but kept really adding quality land bank. So this is worth over 11.6 billion in land value. Uh, we, we purchased over 22 hectares in the first half. We have 100 hectares for reclamation, which is the one in Minglenilia, and over 81.7 hectares developed. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, we've spent so far 5.5 billion in capital expenditures, and primarily these were um, spent for uh, property development, and there was 1.225 billion uh, spent for acquisitions. Uh, we're still uh, the second half will be more um, 
busy, more uh, productive for us. We're really ex expecting to spend the 13 billion that we've uh, set to spend in CAPEX uh, this year with um, some key acquisitions um, in the second half and us really rolling out projects. Um, we have several projects that we're turning over um, as we speak. Next slide. Uh, this is very important because this is really the batting average that uh, should give a lot of assurance and comfort to our market. We are 90% sold across all our inventory. These are inventory that we've had since 2003, net of whatever cancellation or, or you know, back out. So um, that, that's a healthy sign. Why, why does CLI... Um, have this kind of statistic. We really cater to a end user uh, market, right? Uh, yes. An end user market is the market that we've always you know, had that discipline where you know, we, we, we avoid uh, bulk purchasers, uh, large foreign investors to take a building or floors because it's end users who will ride out any cycle. It's end users who will protect their investment. And, and that is why um, we really grown um, the 7.5, 7.4 billion in uh, recognized revenue is our highest half performance so far, and um, it, it's very gratifying because um, it it shows that our diversification in different uh, geographic locations, different uh, asset classes have paid off, and. As we reported in the first half alone, over 7.4 billion of new project sales value was created. Next slide. Okay, so this is a very uh, important slide and this really shows you our confidence and, and transparency. This is all the residential projects we built since our company started. That's 90% sold across um, all this inventory, over 31,000 units, We've been through the 2008 uh, uh, crisis. We've been through, uh, of course, COVID and now in inflationary. And, and look at this. No? And we're just very proud that we invested this much, almost 100 billion in our, in our Visman region. And uh, what's um, really important here is for all our completed projects, 97% sold. Usually you see several other um, uh, maybe companies where even in completion, they're at 80 to 90% sold, but us 97%. For everything that we're still constructing or about to complete, 88% sold. And for everything we've launched so far this year, 80% sold. I think it shows this really reflects leadership. This reflects our very strong team. We're, we're, 800, we're a team of 800 already now. And we are not just responsible in our development, we are very efficient in our operations. And, and this is why we're able to maintain these figures. Next slide. Okay, so this, this is our uh, footprint um, in terms of our uh, sales uh, in the first half alone. So that you can see here how uh, proud we are of our uh, diversification. You can see economic housing launched in Dumaguete. You can see upscale uh, office condo sold here in Mandawi, Cebu. You can see our award-winning uh, township having its first residential offering, which sold out quite quickly in, in, in a few months. And you can see here our mid-market offering in Panglao um, moving very strongly with phase two, alone 54% sold since March. So very nice um, spread of products, meaning CLI can tailor fit uh, to where the demand is and, and bring that needed supply because supply has really slowed down no? uh, as you know series of successive challenges in the market uh, you have COVID with less mobility of course the election period meaning there there is less transact there is less uh, movement um, you know in LGU processing but we've managed to really be persevered no? and, and bring new projects because there's so there's demand I can tell you there's demand there so it's about bringing Supply, having a good brand that delivers on quality service. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what keeps me uh, busy uh, and, and working. And um, I'm very proud to say that these are in various healthy stages of construction. 
you have Metavira Garden Residences here, our first condo in Bacolod, which is already turning over. Casamira Iloilo, we launched at the height of pandemic, but I have maybe more than 600 houses built already there. Bohol, in just two years, I think I have half of the houses that are ready for turnover. So these projects like Belmiro Cagayan, 38 Park Avenue are now turning over and turning over the keys to the initial residents. So we have a healthy mix of recently launched projects, um, topping off projects, and turning over projects here. So these, these uh, all encompass a sales value of 40, 54 billion. Next slide. So you can see here our completed inventory or um, showcase now, not just in Cebu, but also Bacolod, Dumaguetec, again, the Oro and Davao. And if you ask me um, uh, what, what is our outlook no? um, now having completed several projects in the region, I feel we are still scratching the surface. There's a lot more that we can offer to, to our market here. Next slide. Okay. So I want to talk about our, really our diversification efforts. As you know, when we uh, became a publicly listed company in 2017, we want to expand not just geographically, but also product wise, no? revenue wise. So we've completed over 28,400 in gross leasable area with 47,000 more in leasable area coming online very soon. Our goal is really 200,000 square meters of total gross leasable area in the next five years. And you can see our leasing revenue growing um, uh, as mobility and uh, traffic has returned. Uh, now with schools coming back face to face, like uh, one of our uh, mixed use projects with a mall uh, is getting very busy. And you can see us really doing things. If we're able to do great housing, we can do great office buildings like this one in Latitude Corporate Center. Next slide. So these are the um, uh, upcoming um, leasing business for us with our first lifestyle mall, just close to 8,300 growth linkable area, which will be online next year. You have our very um, important and meaningful Patria de Cebu project with 21,000 gross floor area and 182 hotel rooms with a Mercure brand in the heart of downtown Cebu, which will be completed 2024. So you can see our gross leasable area investment growing, contributing more to our um, financial performance, and we're very selective in our uh, leasing partners. Next slide. Okay, so our other diversification effort, CLI became becoming a hospitality and recreational player. So quietly, CLI is actually assembling uh, probably the best collection of international hotel brands in the Bismin region. We have actually 10 hotels in our portfolio and our single hotel uh, with Citadin Cebu grew 271% no, um, from doing low occupancy during COVID to now during doing very good and strong occupancy. So you can see here our master's tower for those fans of CLI keeping track of our SOM design building here. You can see a very large excavation with very large uh, footings uh, and foundations there. You can see our Abaca Resort uh, Maktan here um, um, starting also the foundation works. Um, and and uh, next slide to show you our portfolio. So as you can see here, um, people ask us why assemble hospitality? For one reason, it's attached to several of our mixed use projects. Second, if you look at Vismin, there are really a scarcity of international brands and you have one of the strongest regions for hospitality. So you have our four projects with the Aqua Group, with Citadine Cebu Live, Citadine Bacolod, Citadine Davao. You have our one with the Reds and Red. This is very exciting. We're opening this next year. And you have a two with Accor. And we acquired the Abaca Resort and will be managed by our partners, our friend from the Abaca Group. And you have our first co-living brand with APAD. So if you ask us, this will be an exciting hospitality read uh, in a few years. Next slide. I just wanted to add pala Franco that uh, we welcomed our new uh, officer as investor relations right now. And yeah. one of our special projects, and watch out for this to those listening in, uh, the next, we will hold one of our next few analyst briefings, maybe not the immediate next one, but in the near future, in one of these new hotels. What we plan to do is now that you know, we're opening up a little bit, we want to invite those who can travel to Cebu. So we want to show them um, our project, take a look at what makes our product 
um, so appealing and so compelling to the market and yeah. uh, organize a you know analyst uh, briefing day probably to coincide with one of our public briefings so hopefully we can uh, get that done in 2023 when yeah. uh, you know, things are a little bit more open. So just watch out for that. And we look forward to welcoming, uh, you know, our listeners and our audience, and especially our analysts and those who are following us here in Cebu. We're, we're, we should definitely uh, bring our uh, analysts and um, investors around. Uh, there's so much um, potential that you will see and, 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 and CLI is there at the forefront. So as I said, the, the way we do housing, no? our leadership in housing, we want to achieve that leadership also in hospitality and offices. You can even Google Citadine Cebu. We're actually one of the highest rated hotels in the whole uh, Cebu. Next slide. Okay, so our township. So the picture here on your right is our recently um, inaugurated DGD. We're very proud of this um, uh, showcase there. So we have three uh, existing township sites plus eight mixed use portfolio sites. And as I said, we're really now um, um, you know, going to generate a lot of um, uh, good uh, turnaround you know, with even commercial lots becoming available worth 7.7 .7 billion. Next slide. So these are our township locations. As you know, Ming Mori is the, uh, we reported this several times, the only um, reclamation, uh, sustainable reclamation that was issued and noticed to proceed outside Luzon. This is 80% owned by CLI. You have Kagin de Oro, um, one of my dream projects and are uh, very close to our hearts, our project with Xavier University Ateneo de Cagayan, where we acquired a 14 point hectare um, township property and adjacent to it will be the new location of Xavier University Masters of Campus. We're actually breaking ground next month. And Davao, uh, coming full circle with a project township that has completed site development and uh, we've already launched a residential, uh, retail, and civic um, project there. Next slide. Okay, I'll close my portion with some significant milestones. So just last month, we welcomed the public and, um, and, and officials to our Davao Global Township here, uh, where we inaugurated. So you can see this is located in Matina, Davao. Matina is um, probably the southern growth center or the de most densely populated portion of Davao, just beside the downtown. And we are really positioning this to be the CBD. There is no CBD yet in Davao, and this is what we can offer um, with good design, good sustainable um, uh, features, and probably the largest private roads you'll see in the whole Davao uh, with, with our township. So this is uh, us. Uh, with our joint venture partners, uh, who we're very uh, proud to work with, the Yuso and Huang and, and Tan families of Davao from the Villa Abrile clan. Next slide. And as I said, very exciting, 7.7 .7 billion worth of, so that's actually just um, uh, four hectares of land that we set aside for, for outside investors, while TLI and our partners still kept uh, close to um, 11 hectares of saleable land there. Next slide. Okay, okay. So this is what keeps me and Grant excited. Um, you know, when we turn over projects, I feel this is where we have to prove ourselves. No, how how happy our buyers are, how satisfied they are with our finishing, our turnover time. I think sometimes some developers may take the turnover time for granted. Us, we're so conscious. No, a small delay, we're already very concerned. I can't sleep. So we we redo really our best to deliver. That's your hard earned investment there. So you have 38 Park Avenue here, uh, turning over the lower floors. You have uh, Mesa Vire, uh, such a beautiful property. And I, I think I've, it's exceeded my own expectations. So we've turned over more than 200 units there. Mesa Tierra in Davao, probably the nicest uh, finished condo so far in Davao. We've turned over more than 500 units there. Um, Cagayan de Oro, where we, um, you know, this came out in the news where we gave uh, Carlo Palam, a si silver medalist from Cagayan de Oro, who was living in a shanty um, in an in, in informal settler home, gave him a home here in Delmiro. So we've turned over maybe 30 homes. And here in Cibula, Negro, we've turned over um, more than 400 houses. I think as a developer, we um, really end to end have some discipline because we need to you know, turn over and generate good cash flow while at the same time enhance customer satisfaction. Next slide. 
Okay, so with that, that ends my part on the operations and I turn it over to my closer here, Mr. Grant Cheng, to conclude our uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Rocco. So uh, Video. we have uh, thanks. So we have several projects that uh, we're excited to launch in the second half of uh, 2022, uh, starting with our flagship Casamira uh, product that we're bringing to the north of Cebu. So we have a Casamira South. We're going to build a Casamira North. The Casamira South has is a 3,000 plus strong community already. Um, it is. Um, it allowed us to really perfect that Casamira model, and we can't wait to bring this to the vibrant north, where there are uh, there's so much economic activity, uh, tourism activity, and we know that this this is going to sell like hotcakes because even as early as now, even as we're still in the design and planning stage, um, our brokers and uh, our in uh, our potential buyers. Um, are already inquiring about this um, and uh, the demand is going to be very strong. Um, we have a beautiful mid-market tower that we're building in downtown Cebu called Calia 104 uh, with a very strong uh, Cebuano heritage flavor um, that we're going to put there. It's going to be a beautiful project with, and it's very centrally located um, right beside uh, the economic and commercial heart of uh, Cebu as well as many of its strongest uh, strongest uh, medical and healthcare institutions. We're expanding our mantra residences in Mandawe. And, uh, you know, and just one last note, we're going to expand as well our first ever beach town condo. Uh, we, we sold out our first two towers very strongly. And uh, this uh, condominium, which has its own uh, beachfront, is, you know, uh, it, it reminds me of how real estate really boomed in the coastal towns of Miami and California and how you could really build a community with its own beachfront. But this is, we're talking about Cebu prime white sand beachfront. And you could literally see uh, corals of fish swimming in front of it. And, you know, this used to be a marine resort and we can't wait to offer the, the third tower in this development. It's going to be a beautiful project. Okay. And of course, as Franco mentioned, the other big driver is uh, our lot sales at the VAR Global Township, which we've already launched. So that's going to come. Uh, that's ongoing, and we have some very key locators, very strategic investors we're, we're, uh, that, we're, that we're reaching out to and that we're in dialogue with right now. And then one last uh, thing to mention, we're coming to Palawan, and we're launching our beach town condo as well in Bohol. Uh, again, just replicating what is already a successful business model with already an established proof of concept. So please, um, I'd like to take this opportunity actually to invite everyone on this call. Visit our website. We invested a lot in monitoring and documenting the progress of our project. So if you're a buyer or investor, if you're just curious about what we do and why we sell out our products, take a look at our virtual tours. Visit our so-called economic or affordable housing project. Have you ever wondered what a 3 million peso house and lot product will look like and how we deliver that, it's really beautiful. It's it's something that we're proud to give to the Filipino family. Yeah, Grant, I'll just add here. Course, no, no. Sometimes I know um, buyers of ours join Anna's briefing, so yeah. our buyers in Palawan should be excited. Uh, we're really about to launch this very soon, the first um, condo or Casamira Tower condo in Puerto Princesa. So uh, please expect that to be another hit because um, we've designed a very generous product for you. All right. Thanks, Franco. Okay. Um, let's go. Uh, next slide. So I, we do want to keep, um, you know, uh, to allocate time for our Q and A. It's always very lively. We want uh, an engaged uh, community. So this is my last slide. Um, so we gave uh, guidance of twenty percent uh, earnings growth uh, for uh, year on year from twenty twenty one. So. Uh, by all indications, um, this is the kind of uh, growth to the parent that uh, we will be able to deliver even after that uh, that one-time gain. So uh, this this is what gives us that confidence, and we're we're pretty um, we're we have an assurance, or at least uh, if the first half is anything to go by, uh, this is a number that we will comfortably hit. 
if not exceed. So once again, uh, thank you everyone for your time. I see some questions in the, uh, the Q&A uh, box already. Um, we're going to queue them up. And I encourage everyone to please send in your questions uh, as we address them one by one. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Sir Grant and Sir Franco. Um, let me read uh, this first question from Aaron Boy. Congratulations on your strong results. Can you update us if you intend to pay off or refinance the three billion short dated? Yeah, I'll I'll answer that. Uh, we will we will pay it off, but will we refinance it? Um, not in the traditional definition of refinancing where we completely roll it over. Uh, the unique thing about these short dated notes is it's being held by only one institution or one investment house. And what we want to do is we want to respect uh, their decision and flexibility to be able to redeem or you know, take delivery of the principal of the short dated notes. Um, and should they come, uh, uh, you know, should uh, in our further conversations, should we establish that there's mutual interest to uh, reinvest a certain amount in CLI, certainly we can definitely, you know, that's something that we'd very much welcome, something that we'd very much uh, entertain uh, towards next year. Um, but for now, that 8 billion uh, corporate notes will definitely be used to uh, help us uh, pay that down. Thank you for that, sir. Um, we have another question from uh, Michael Hilado. Good morning. What was your cancellation rate on book revenues for uh, the first half of 2020? Yeah, I can uh, also answer that. Uh, for the first half of 2022, sorry. For the first half of 2022, our uh, cancellation rate is just slightly under uh, 4% versus uh, the cancellation rate of 4.1% uh, for the whole year of 2021. So if anything, in fact, uh, 2020 and 2021, during those pandemic years, uh, we, our buyers probably face a little bit of an economic challenge, an economic squeeze, and we saw a slight uptick in our cancellation rate to 4.1% in 2020 at, by by the end of 2021. So it's stabilized now. We are just under 4% this year. And I will very quickly add a couple of things. The reservation sales number that we are reporting are all net of cancellations. The revenue figures that we are reporting are net of any reversals of revenues that we'd had to recognize from cancellation. So something to keep in context. Two final points to keep in context. The other one is I talked about the strong demand uh, that CLI is selling into, right? So while cancellations is something that we are proactively managing, we have a dedicated customer service team that reaches out to buyers and offers them stretched payment terms, grace periods, penalty waivers in case it's justified. So we, we don't just sit idly and just let these accounts go delinquent and eventually get canceled. Um, we know that this is an investment and if we can find a way to work together to rescue and give you more opportunities to, if you're committed into your contract, we will find a solution and a mutually acceptable path by which you can continue your contract. But having said that, if there is a cancellation, there's also a corresponding recovery rate. And I want to answer your question uh, I, I want to answer this question in conjunction with by giving the recovery rate, no, uh, Aaron. And recovery rate means the rate at which I can sell my canceled units in a 12-month period. And our recovery rate is over 70%. So I'm not too worried about cancellations at this point because, in fact, there's a wait list of buyers. And in fact, most of the time, I can sell my canceled units at a slightly higher price because when they cancel, it means the project is a little bit further in its construction progress. There's been price increases. This is really more of an administrative concern. We don't want the hassle of cancellations. But more importantly, it's for our buyers. Uh, it is not a good, we feel it's not a good financial decision to uh, buy into a home and then cancel afterwards. You're not going to get an entire, a, a, a full refund on that because of some costs. 
Um, so it is our way to not only watch out uh, for our business model and the health of our eventual portfolios, it's our way to also help um, our buyers make sure they stay committed to what is a big financial responsibility of owning a home. So uh, hope that's able to answer uh, those uh, questions. I think there were a couple of questions in our chat box that uh, address that uh, that's related to it. Thank you, Sir Grant. Um, for this next question, I think this is for Sir Franco. Yeah. How many, uh, this is from Mar Carmela Marquez. How many years of development will your 116 hectare land bank take? Yeah, what's good with our land bank now, we've added townships to it. Um, projects like the Davao Global Township and the Xavier um, University, uh, we call it our Manresa Town, will take 10 to 15 years uh, to fully develop. But of course, to maintain our growth momentum, no? we are very committed to maintaining that growth momentum. So I would say the existing land bank, if we don't acquire anything at all, no, uh, will, will be consumed in five years, plus the 10 to 15 of the township. So our goal is always um, to prospect for good properties. And the good thing about Wismin is the cost of land is much less than the cost of land in Luzon. So we're able to uh, have good margins, uh, good speed, um with our development so you know how uh we've grown uh from uh, 30 project to 100 projects in the last six years and it, so but our land bank has been maintained above the 1 million square meter so th there is this um uh, really organic uh, ability for us really good uh, source of land and on top of, of buying land partnerships no? uh, one fourth of cli's projects are with joint venture partners with the largest landowners in the region. That allows us really to sustain the type of trajectory we set out for. So thank you for that question. Um, next question sir is, I think still for you, how are your residential payment terms so far, considering that CLI has high exposure towards economic to mid-class segment? Are okay. we seeing stretch payment terms similar to what the other developers are doing yeah i think um no i have an important answer to this right honestly we are past pandemic stage so i think we are not already living in in a pandemic mindset we have to go go out no uh, of it I, I would say that we're very happy that we're catering to the economic and mid-market segment because these are the, the the buyers the end users that are protecting their investment they will strive to protect it now with um, jobs returning, even OFW uh, bis, OFW remittances back from, these are now more stable. This is actually the more stable market because when you go to the higher end of the range, these are maybe they can afford, but these are the, the buyers who also don't need them need it. Right, they speculate a bit more. Yes, right? yeah. So I would say the economic mid market are the better market right now. No, the end user, but. Stretch payment terms, to be very honest, we're still doing three years to four year down payment terms. We have never been tempted to go five years, six years. What for? I mean, why will money of the buyer be stuck five years, six years? Yeah. What's that about? Actually, <laughs> and I want to supplement that answer. Actually, we've gone the other way. Yeah. We've actually tightened our payment terms because tighter payment terms such as increased reservation fees, um, a higher equity amount actually screened and filters out what I call weaker buyers or weaker hands. And really, we get the buyers that are committed yeah. to their purchase. So okay. if anything, we've gone the opposite direction, increasing or at least ensuring the quality, yeah. the, the type of buyers we're getting yeah. in our portfolio. Right. I think one good thing we're doing now is we're, you know, as I said, 90% sold net of cancellation. We're also cleaning out accounts. So those uh, who really don't have the capacity to maintain their units, we just say, you know, we have to give it to, to, to somebody else. And that's better because if you hang on to a bad, bad account until the end, it's, it's harder to resell or, or find a new buyer at the end. And I think that's the discipline we've been doing these last two and a half years. Um, uh, so I would say us being disciplined, keeping our payment terms at three to four years, mm. also short ability to deliver in three to four years. Yeah. Uh, um, that's a good ground game. Again, we're talking about um, in, in most cases now for housing, we're actually advanced. No, The houses are standing, but I still, uh, my due date for the houses are still next year. So we have a better problem uh, to deal with with that. So it's, thank you for that good question. And I would say just to recap, the economic and mid-market housing are actually the better market because they will protect um, that investment. And 
what what's two million? What's ten thousand in down payment versus a a ten million to fifty million peso condo where the buyer can say, you know, I will just pay later. I'm I'm not in a rush. So thank you for that question. See, I I think related. Let's answer the question about in-house financing okay? Okay. because that's related to the, our our buyers uh, and our payment terms. And the uh, the question here is, if I may read this out loud. Um, is offering in-house financing a part of your future plans? And if not, what are the challenges that you anticipate with offering in-house financing to uh, the buyers? And the answer there is uh, we do not plan to offer in-house financing as part of our future plans. And because, and why not? What are the challenges? Uh, that's a different core competency. Uh, credit, uh, credit analysis and reporting and collections and enforcement and that's just a very different type of uh, business model uh, of a real estate developer. The, and the key difference with in-house financing is that you are essentially turning a part of your balance sheet into a bank because you're transferring already inventory into the name of your end user. So you practically delivered that unit and then you are financing that purchase versus our normal uh, business, which is that if they cancel, there's the inventory has not been delivered and the asset remains on our balance sheet, we could resell it very easily, right? There's no foreclosure. Um, yeah. there, is, there, there, there is no um, uh, there's no eviction process here. So we want to stick to being a real estate developer yeah. and we want to give or we want to work with our banking partners, especially our friends at Pangibig. They are the ones that offer the creditors that are able to analyze that have an infrastructure to be able to do this. And so we want to pass, we, we are a developer. We build, we design, we sell, we market, and then we turn over the products and then we let uh, our uh, banking and financial institution friends handle the collections and the financing. Okay. And one last note on that. Um, usually, if you offer in-house financing, and this is a very poignant I don't know, uh, matter that I do want to uh, raise. If you scan the market, normally in-house financing offers the highest oh, yeah. rate yeah, of financing. So you ask yourself yeah. the question, why would a or why would a business offer in-house financing for their own product versus your buyer getting financing on their own? Usually, especially if you, are, you offer the highest rate, usually it means that the buyer might not have qualified or might have been rejected. So that also means by definition, you are using your balance sheet to catch or to risk or to, to essentially hold on to the worst credit, right? Those that don't uh, pass banking standards. So, kung itatagal ko, isasalo mo yung pinakamasamang credit. So, not really sure if that's what I want to do with my balance sheet, uh, which uh, goes back to our earlier point. What we want to do very early on is to uh, is to be able to nurture and inculcate the value of financial discipline to our buyers. So eventually when we give them to the financing institutions like pag like the home loan division of the bank, this is something that they are already um, accustomed to in terms of their financial responsibilities, yung mga monthly payment. So that's our business model. Hope I was able to answer that question for you. Uh, maybe we can answer uh, this question also from Carmela Marquez. This is also uh, related to um, collection. So how is uh, the collection experience of CLI and what is your path due rate? Okay. Uh, the collection experience is very good. Uh, in fact, a qualitative and quantitative answer. Qualitative answer is that we have, uh, uh, we have already enhanced many payment channels for CLI and make it convenient for our buyers. You can pay with GCash. You can pay with your credit card. You can go to many of our accredited banks where CLI is an accredited biller. You can go online banking. You could pay by credit card. You could go to Lulier and in fact pay your contracts with CLI. So we've enhanced and made it, uh, made it more convenient for our buyers to find different ways uh, to pay us their monthly payments. Number one. Number two, our, so our collection experience is that about 5.3% of our buyers are a little behind on their payments. So if you translate that to, a, to the cancellation rate that I mentioned earlier of below 4%, it means while we have some buyers who are a little bit behind in their payments, we have a dedicated department now that reaches out to them and, and where we try to work with them and say, 
Is there a way we can save your account? Do you need a little bit more stretch payments? Do you need a grace period? Or do you need an alternative payment method that maybe you're not yet aware of? We're able to rescue a good portion of this, these accounts and bring them back to current. Yeah. Next. Thank you, sir. Um, for this next question, I think this is for Sir Franco. Uh, will you be taking part in the 101 Star <laughs> Global City Mandawe? And uh, how about in the. I assume this. Uh, attendee is from Cebu. So no, we're not taking part in the 101 hectare uh, Global City Mandawe, although we do have a site uh, close by in Umapad, uh, a 25 hectare uh, development that, that is titled no, um, uh, Inland in Umapad. And uh, in SRP, we really not seriously considered SRP. I think the challenge with SRP is uh, property values have risen, I would say, uh, beyond the real value, you know, SRP is doing 250,000 per square meter of land costs when you can go to the heart of Cebu, uh, Banila, Cebu IT Park, Business Park at 300,000 per square. So um, I would say, um, and also it's a reclaimed property, meaning you have to spend more for, for additional piles and foundations. So I would say it's not a value for money uh, site anymore. It's more of a uh, nice to have. Although I would admit that SRP is really developing quite nicely with um, uh, what Robinson's land is doing there, a very nice uh, mixed use project. I think SM is also developing arena plus the connection to the new bridge. But the, the, the downside really is the property values have risen too high uh, there. And, and meaning if we would develop there, we would have to do a high end project, but that's not a high end uh, area. mark area yet. The high end area is here uptown. Where, where our office is. No? So the, that's how we developers would assess it. Why will I offer a 10 million peso studio there where you can get a 7 million peso studio closer okay. to the heart of the city? So it, it's already failed economics from the start. No? But, uh, but as I said, it, it's a very nice area to, to, to check out, but for us not, not to develop. <laughs> so uh, next question. Um, this question is from Irene. Uh, what is the total project cost for the soon to launch projects uh, maybe in uh, 2022 and what, what's the source of funding? Okay, so uh, it was reported we've spent over five and a half billion of CAPEX and uh, we, we still have around eight billion more to spend. Um, because we, we are very lucky to have very strong banking partnerships uh, and, and one of the reasons I feel great is we've We've proven to them our worth. No? We have a very strong banking relationship. So every project has its equivalent term loan. Now we're doing a, a retail bond offering with $8 billion, uh, to source. Uh, of course, um, plus corporate note issuance that we've done uh, pre-pandemic. -pre so we're very lucky that there's very good matching with, uh, with our funding sources due to our project requirements. Uh, but more specifically, Grant, is there anything you want well, to add? Well, of funding, of course, our number one source of funding will always be internally generated funds. As yeah. I mentioned, in the next 12 months, we're anticipating yeah. over 8 billion pesos worth of, intern again, internally generated cash from collections of sales of units that we're turning over. So we take, uh, you know, we take our uh, cash disbursement needs uh, and then we wrap them and we first say, we look at how much is the cost to complete for a certain project? What, the, what are the payment and billing schedules? Uh, we look at our debt payment obligations, for principal plus interest, our potential tax obligations. So we map them all out. But the number one source would internally generated funds. One, our uh, from takeouts from our monthly equity collection from the buyers, which is close to about 150 million pesos a month already in terms of monthly payments of our buyers. Yeah. Um, uh, as well as, as Franco mentioned, our very strong banking relationships with our uh, corporate banking partners, as well as the capital markets. Um, we've, uh, we're happy that to, to get uh, an upgraded uh, credit rating from field ratings of AA plus. So very, you know, just a hair away from AAA, but again, it underlies the, the confidence and uh, the faith that the financial markets have in our company. And again, this is, uh, this is uh, one of what I always say. Uh, the more you know the market, the more comfortable you are. The more you know, you know how much, how broad and how deep the demand is. How many layers of demand there are that even a pandemic could not sufficiently bring down demand 
um, versus supply, it's, we're still in a deficit mode in terms of housing. You can look at all the government statistics out there. We we need to build more houses, especially in and there's no other player who does it better here in Brisbane who with that same focus. So um, the, no pro, these are the main sources of funding, and that we we're confident will continue in the in the foreseeable future. I think last few questions. Yeah, uh, we have two more questions here, sir. Um, What's the outlook of CLI on residential prices in this main region, particularly for your project? <laughs> I'll let Franco answer it, but I'll just say. Franco, say you first, Franco. Yeah. That was, I'll, I have something to say. Um, I guess um, this is where I think it's a local player that can address this well. Because, you know, we really want to cater to the right affordability level. We always have to be conscious of, you know, what can the market afford? and for what it can afford, how can we ensure that that investment will grow or appreciate? No? So you don't want to overprice because you leave little for the buyer to gain, right? So I, I would say proudly, in spite of inflationary pressures the last three years, I think on average we've increased prices by just five percent on average. But um, we we are very conscious that what can really the people afford? Let, let's say five to ten percent. So in the next uh, two years, siguro, an additional, it's more inflation. Parang we want to uh, parang pattern it after inflation would be a good reason. Because if we just really protect ourselves too much, we, if we increase prices by 20%, 30%, that will do more harm, not just for us. There will be less buyers. The other harm is we make our investors um, have less um, appreciation potential. So... I would say five to ten percent increases in the next uh, uh, one to two years would be a good strategy that will protect both the buyer and the developer. Uh, CLI. Yeah. Okay, I will just say that you know there's a saying that land and real estate is always your best hedge against the inflation, right? And uh, so I will just encourage if you're in the market right now, uh, you better buy earlier than later because. Um, I'll tie it to what I mentioned earlier. There was some uh, pressure on our margins, which shows that uh, we would want to give the benefit of keeping our prices stable to our end users and buyers before we're forced to raise prices. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we first take, uh, there, you know, there, there's a little bit, you, we, you can't just pass on the cost, and we first take a little bit of hit on our margins, but that will be inevitable. So buy if you're in the market right now. Time is of the essence. Um, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's something that to any financially savvy investor, you know that real estate should right. be part of your portfolio. And yeah. to the homeowners, no better time to start or to begin your future today. Yeah, like for example, like I smile when I see employees of ours who bought one of our earlier projects called Mivesa Garden Residences. Ah, oh. You know, that was pre-sold at 65,000 pesos per square or 1.3 million pesos. So when I see an employee who bought it, I smile. You know, it's worth <laughs> 120,000 per square now you know, in value. So, you know, it's always the early ones and uh, I guess the buyers will screen out now where the good developers, what are the good location, what's the good pricing. And, right. and we look at that very, very carefully and with a very strong um, and discipline uh, is what we look at there. Uh, so thank you for the very good questions uh, from our analysts. Thank you. Uh, there's one last question, sir, in the Q&A box um, asking about the revenue recognition criteria of CLI. Okay, so this is, uh, let, I'll take this. Yeah. This is something that uh, we constantly check and agree with our auditors. So the answer there, it's about a six to seven months worth of monthly payments translating to 2% of the total contract. Or if you look at the equity amortization period, that is about one six, uh, anywhere from 20 to 25% of, the of their scheduled equity collections. Yes. And why is this? And this is important to understand the context. First, what we test for is the stability of cancellation after that threshold period. So what we look at is once a buyer has paid anywhere from six to eight months worth of equity payment, then we have a very high degree of confidence that this is what we call a season account. It is an account or a buyer that uh, knows and is committed to this financial transaction 
and you will see the cancellation rate really drop off a cliff and we know that it means that these are a cohort of buyers that are very committed to it and so it's, uh, this is something that we test constantly uh, with our third-party auditors. Internally, it's also a test for us to know how stable our customer base is. So I hope that uh, so, you know uh, that sufficiently answers your question. Yeah. Uh, there's one more follow-up question oh, sure. here from Michael Vilado. Okay, sure. Um, I think this is for Sir Franco. How do you uh, mitigate rising costs aside from selling price uh, selling price increases? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a good question to to end this, no? Because we're now maybe uh, at a point in the year where inflation has cooled down. Uh, that's the good news, and and I have firsthand information. For example, steel bars from a high of fifty-seven pesos per kilo, we're now back to forty-three. That's a twenty-plus percent drop, you no, know, in three months. Hooray! Hooray! <laughs> so, so uh, you know, oil is also dropping. Yeah, I, yeah. I just I, uh, it's it's although twenty percent down. Uh, while it's still a little bit off uh, pre-2022, it, it, it helps, no? It helps. So I think this is where uh, we differentiate the small developers with the, with the big and national ones. Because I think the big national ones like CLI command volume. We command relationships with our suppliers. So I would say we're with the largest buyer of steel bars in the Vismin area. No, we, we buy in the in the one million of kilo uh, monthly, uh, and and cement also maybe five hundred thousand bags a month. So we command the volume and get very good preferential rates. I think I speak for us as a as a developer that has taken care of suppliers and has good relationships. So that has helped us mitigate. No, as I said, if if we don't, I think this is where the smaller players might get affected because they cannot command the volume or or the the terms. No. So aside from that, it's now inflationary pressures cooling down, no? thanks to interventions from our central bank, um, the global market also normalizing. Uh, we see improvements in some costing, and that will definitely help us to 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 not add pressure to increase selling prices, no? which we have really disciplined ourselves from doing. So there's there's a little bit of of, of good news there, and and I think we as a company also have in-house construction management, meaning. Because we manage our construction projects ourselves, the visibility on cost, time, schedule um, helps us speed up projects. So the longer we do projects, the longer we're exposed to these uh, pressures, right? So we're, since we're delivering project, housing project in three years, condo project in three to four years, we're able to, to mitigate that better. So thank you for that question. Yeah. That's the last yeah. year. Okay, so uh, with that, on behalf of our chairman, Mr. Joe Sobrano, our board, um, we're very happy to, to be with you. Over 70 to 80 attendees with us today on a busy Friday. Um, we are very motivated, as I say, to keep uh, making our investors proud, our analysts uh, you know, uh, impressed, and we hope you can share the good news of, of CLI, our operations, our, you know, our, our good ground game here in the business region. And as you know, we're very, uh, we like questions, so uh, if you have additional questions, you can address this to our uh, investor relation team. And sometimes we, we really personally address those as well. Grant, Grant, anything else? That's it. I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, you know, very soon I will be able to welcome you here in Cebu. I'm sure. You know, I think that's something we can all look forward to. Um, so you can personally see the, you know, really see and uh, see for yourselves, you know, uh, the kind of products that we are selling for the kind of budget. Um, that we are selling to the market too. I, 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 for one, am quite excited about that. So I will see you all and thank you for your time again. Yeah, have a good Friday, everyone. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. Go <laughs> <laughs>